every aspect of life, jobs, employment, wealth, discrimination uh, in education, criminal justice, media, housing, health, mental health, um, insurance agencies, loans, banking, every aspect of life that we can think about has significant forms of elements of structural racism, or shall we say evidence of racial disparity that's operating. There's been a pretty explicit ideological war over the past 40 years between the story of structural racism and the emergent and now dominant story of colorblindness. So let's start with just some basic definitions. Structural racism in the US is the normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics, historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal, that routinely advantage whites while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. Colorblindness, or I'm calling it colorblind ideology, makes the argument that only the absence of accounting for race will bring racial equality. And that we must reject all racial categorizations, record keeping, make no distinctions based on race in order to reach a colorblind context for a fair, equal society. So it, it fundamentally relies on the idea that race is not operating now and that we must keep it that way by being colorblind. Now, I could spend a whole 45 minutes on how we got this colorblindness exactly, you know, what, what, the, what the easy mechanisms were, the kind of manipulation of King's very famous phrase, um, content of character, not color of skin. He didn't say anything about being blind. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I know he's rolling over in his grave. Um, about that phrase, like, I should have changed it, who could know? Um, <laughs> um, but, but colorblindness um, is, is uh, extremely resistant to illuminating any categories of race and, any, and therefore any measurements, which makes, of course, the whole structural racism argument completely antithetical to colorblind ideology. But it also assumes, in addition to that race does, is it doesn't matter now, it also means that we have to assume racial hierarchies are not already operating. That society is fundamentally fair if it's left alone to its own devices. It also rejects policies that are designed, and this is very important because colorblind ideology has been at the heart of the, the ending of any kinds of programs designed to redress a legacy of structural discrimination. So you can't solve the problem by saying any, anything that looks like affirmative action in any sphere becomes extremely uh, problematic in the context of colorblind ideology. And the Supreme Court's been you know, very significant in ending, transforming, forcing dramatic curtailments of a variety of efforts to try to remedy even past discrimination. I'm not even talking about new fangled present day versions of it, just the past. So I put it in this way, and this is how sort of everyday people can back themselves into the logic of colorblindness. People would say to themselves, well, since most people believe in racial equality, which includes myself, and since the laws have been changed to outlaw discrimination, and since I don't see color, well, we'll give you that one, so I can't be a racist, and since no special benefits are accrued to me based on whiteness, question mark, racism <laughs> isn't causing these inequalities. So you end up with a kind of if then, if then, if, if all these things are true, then I don't know what y'all problems are about, right? Because this, I've passed my own litmus test. So what remains left here at the end of this kind of self-check? What remains left is actually the heart of colorblind ideology in the way it gets deployed, and that's the behavior. Because colorblind ideology imagines that there are no structures impeding us, so we have a kind of individual capacity, and this must be about the behavior of those who are being discriminated against. They must either bring it upon themselves or be uninterested, and they have imputed cultural limitations that get understood as motivating their experiences with structural racism. Given both the, the, the argument that's made by uh, colorblindness, uh, but also the argument that, um, that relies on culture, that there's a huge racial disparity in what people think about when racial equality will be achieved. So this one, this Lawrence Bobo, a uh, sociologist at, who was then at Harvard, does a study that shows that 61% of whites think we've already achieved equality, racially speaking, and it's on the horizon for another 20. So 80% of white people think we're pretty much scot-free, we're, we're almost home. 
I don't know what they're doing. Okay. Um, they, live, they live in multiracial communities. Okay. <laughs> okay. 17% of black people think we've achieved equality. 36 think it's on the horizon. And the other half are not so sure about when it's going to happen. But this is a very big gap. This is a significant gap in, if nothing else, perception. We don't know what education's about, but if the 61% of whites think we have already achieved it, and a 20, another 20 think it's around the corner, how in God's name do we convince those 80% of respondents that racism is an impediment? You see, so this perception drives a rejection of the consciousness you need to fight structural racism. And now, you know, some people say this out of Pollyanna hopefulness. You know, it's just right around the corner and, oh, it's going to be fine. Um, but there is a willful kind of resistance. So the focus on behavior, the belief that equality has already or will soon take place, work together to facilitate the rejection of policies that many think would, in fact, work to counter structural racism. But there have been some important journalistic trajectories recently. In particular, what's happened with police brutality and you know, state murder has brought more attention to what the conditions might be around it. But there's a, res there's, a, there's a mainstream public narrative that is driven by colorblindness, but that approaches this kind of information with three particular strategies. And there, there are others, but these are three. One is that these are structural anomalies, right? This, you know, just just a weird one-off, something happened and went wrong, that the criminal justice system works, just sometimes it doesn't work, you know, just, oh, there's these few times over here, and oh, well, that one was just a procedural thing, and this one, the guy had mental problems, and he lunged at him, and this other guy, he's 6'4", and this, you know, so there's sort of like a perpetuation of anomalies. And the other one is the one bad apple. Oh, there's a rogue cop. There's just one rogue cop. Right, who 17 times, you know, nobody pays any attention to, and he's just so rogue, nobody notices, but he's just one bad apple, <laughs> right? But the, the, you know, it doesn't spoil the whole tree, of course, because the system works. That's a, one is a structural and only, the other one's a sort of personalized one. And then the third one is just the demonization of either the victim or the community. So just recently I was going through some, I don't even know what kind of website, but, um, um, Freddie Gray's family and others have asked them, the media to stop referring to him as the son of an uneducated heroin addict. It's like, well, wait, just exactly what is the value of that information here? It's like, well, if he was an educated non-heroin addict, then the police would not have done to him what they did? Is that, is that what we're really saying? So, like, there's this constant sort of demonization and marginalization and, and, and reduction of the humanity of victims as a means by which to normalize status quo and render the visibility of structural racism foggy at best. So, even if we buy structural racism, which I'm going to just take for granted for the sake of argument that you do, if we do that, we still have these three, these three uh, impediments. We have that the discrimination itself continues in new forms and practices. So actually, it's a constant project. It does, it's not the same thing it was even 10 years ago. Um, you know, someone wrote a really interesting piece about the end of redlining, right, with, with subprime lending being the exact inverse of redlining, right? Redlining, was, we're not gonna get, which we're going to talk about in a minute, we, you know, we're not going to give you any loans. Subprime lending is we're going to give you a whole lot of really bad loans. You know, it's just sort of like it never ends. Like, it's like, what's the newfangled way we can create bad outcomes and take a lot of money? Um, banks are very creative with this. So there are new forms and practices. So you can't tackle something very easily when it's always shifting, right? You have to figure out what are the core things that seem to be continuous. The second thing is the way in which colorblind ideology and the stories hide um, what's going on and blames uh, personal behavior. And the third is the special favors narrative. Um, because anything that smacks of special favors, people resist and they just have a knee-jerk kind of rejection. Um, doesn't matter what the data is. So my argument is that research alone is not going to interrupt this interconnected set of perceptions. If it were, it probably would have done it by now because the research is staggering. So the How Structural Racism Works project is, is an attempt to figure out how do we tell this story in a way that builds the kind of emotional momentum the colorblind ideology built. You know, how do we actually make people feel connected to it in some way? So the first part was to sort of decide, okay, how do we tackle where it's happening and how do we condense it in such a way that might make it um, sort of 
graspable because again it really is everywhere so I just made a what I guess you'd call a kind of educated slash executive personal choice decision that these five areas are incredibly significant not only consequential but dynamic and interactive but as they're listed here you see them and as they are in this image they are operating in their own spheres right there's a real sense that the media and criminal justice and housing, wealth, and education have their own circumstances and they're operating independently. This is often how we talk about this. We talk about them as single sphere. We look for housing discrimination and we look for a legacy of it, but we don't think about how it connects to all these other factors. So part of the vision of the project is to put these gears in relationship to one another. To one, explain that the system is designed to reproduce these disparities. Right? So it's not a one-off, it's not a bad apple, it's a history of intentional constant reproduction through different mechanisms, and that they're interactive and interconnected along multiple pegs, that, that you could start this in any number of places and connect them in different ways, and that they reinforce each other. It's not a single sphere set of problems. If we end mass incarceration tomorrow, we'll still have a tremendous level of problems in many other spheres that are interactive with mass incarceration, um, but interdependent, interactive, and compounding. So this is, thinking of it this way and figuring out how to tell the story this way seems to be uh, one, of the, one of the goals so far. So okay, so let's say we take the housing gear. Now this gear could have like, 10 more pegs with policies, but just imagine this gear here to describe some of the main policies uh, that have happened over time in to create really black communities slash you know, constrained, ghettoized black communities often. Um, the policies that have done that along with many other things. So these are just a handful, there are many others. But when you take them together, they have pretty much gutted the ongoing stability of predominantly black or all or, or mainly African American and Latino communities. So they've de devalued these communities and the property owners in them and their property created incredibly high hurdles for ownership of homes and businesses and in, a, in, a, in an indirect way transferred risks that would otherwise be dis disparate across society that by creating pockets of privileges and resources and buffer zones, troubles and problems are disaccumulated from one area and hyper accumulated in communities of color. But so let's take here, let's look at redlining for a moment because it's such a big one. Redlining and the homeowners alone corporation and the FHA operated from 33 to 1977 until it was outlawed to redline American city neighborhoods with, with uh, use a color-coded system for determining which neighborhoods were suitable and which residents were suitable for loans. So they took city, you can find these maps all over Google. They, they're still in existence. I mean, you can see the old maps. Um, and if it was green and you, you, you were put in green, you got a rating of an A, and that the basis for the rating was entirely racial. It was about on being an all-white neighborhood and lacking a single foreigner or Negro. If you got a red marking, now there were, there were grades in between, so the more you became of color, it would say dangerous mixed race communities with Latinos, Asian Americans, and blacks. But the worst possible rating were for which there was no lending were neighborhoods where any black people lived and where they were therefore given the lowest rating and ruled completely ineligible for home and business loans. It didn't matter how many and it didn't matter what their social class was. Not that it should, but it's just a point to be made. And these were partnerships between government and private businesses designed to stabilize and expand home ownership um, uh, for um, some communities, but not these others. And there were literally, this had nothing to do with credit, had nothing to do with jobs, it had, it had everything to do fundamentally with a state and government and private uh, enterprise transfer of value and privilege to the category of whiteness. Lipsitz, George Lipsitz calls this a possessive investment in whiteness, that the nation makes an investment in whiteness. And then of course people are gonna wanna hold on to it because it has value and they're gonna wanna protect it because it, it, is, it is being rewarded. Fair Housing Act of 1968 is happy news except in the version I'm gonna tell you right now. Um, which is that it was fought for and it was lobbied for and it was an amazing piece of, of legislation along with many other civil rights acts of, uh, of 
you know, anti-discrimination law. And this banned discrimination in all the places, this is just a few, intimidation and coercion because there was constant threats to black people if they moved into white neighborhoods. Uh, there was racial steering. We're like, oh, we don't have any homes over here, but we have them over here. Block busting in which neighborhoods were intentionally broken up so that profits could be gleaned and so white flight could be accelerated and slum lords could exact higher prices for worse maintained um, properties and redlining. So it was passed by Johnson with an aim of you know, creating, uh, this is in some sense, um, an anti-discrimination law that's trying to level the housing playing field. But the, you know, the person who had to deal with it was Richard Nixon, because it happened at the end of Johnson's term, and Nixon was not all so excited about this. He called it forced integration, and consistently uh, interrogated his staff, fired people who tried to implement it. So between 1974 and 1983, not a single dollar was withheld from any city or town that may have been practicing housing discrimination. So if you, if you, again, we don't have time here today to go into the depths of how it works, but I guarantee you somebody did, and not one single dollar. Here's a law. What happens? Nothing, right? So this is, again, why colorblind ideology is so dangerous because it relies on the use of a law and not the actual application and, and, and implementation of it. So what we're talking about here is a set of practices and policies and behaviors on the ground that have created, um, structurally speaking, incredibly fragile and economically deprived and highly burdened neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are carrying the risks and accumulated um, uh, disadvantages that are produced in other parts of society in very compacted spaces. In fact, the entire logic of the notion of a ghetto, which was not a black phenomenon originally, but when you say the word today, pretty much that's what people think, is actually a construction, right? It is an intentional construction. But the power and legacy of housing discrimination is, is much more uh, powerful when you think about it in relationship to the spheres that are around it. So very briefly, you know, I want to just help you think about how these gears might interact. So the most obvious one, for those of you who already studied this material, is that the primary way we fund education and public schools in the United States is through what? Taxes. What determines property taxes? The value of your house. So now if you've had 100 years of no home ownership because you, you have been denied loans, or high-risk loans that mean you have high levels of foreclosures that you actually qualified not to have but were given anyway, economic discrimination in other spheres, you're not going to have a tax base to generate the kind of resources for schools in your neighborhood. So here you have an educational outcome where the institution of education is understood as the great leveler, right? This is going to be the great equalizer. Everyone works hard in school. It's a meritocracy system. They get out the other end and everything works out. Um, so um, what you see here is a very clear and easy kind of educational intersection. If you think, for example, even if we take the notion of ghettoization and think about it, um, as we've been talking about you know, these neighborhoods here, you obviously have a tremendous capacity for racialized policing, right? You have a, if you segregate people and put them under full surveillance, you have a capacity to create two tiers of a, of a system without really anybody else noticing. So you notice before all of the last three years of, of focus on police brutality, there, was a there still is, but there was a tremendous amount of skepticism. Oh, police wouldn't do that. I've never seen a policeman do that. Well, if you live over here, you saw a policeman do this all the time. It's not a question, right? So you have a d deep interaction here where, for example, you can have a war on drugs in this neighborhood Right. If this, assuming this here is a black neighborhood, um, you can have a war on drugs in this neighborhood, even though black people do not use drugs at any rate higher than whites. In fact, they use many of them less. But th nobody else ever gets the, their pockets turned inside out on a constant basis. Stop and frisk only works in a segregated context. You can't just go around stopping and frisking Wall Street bankers. It doesn't really work out so well. <laughs> Housing generates. Tremendous amount of wealth. It's the most significant wealth transfer for most citizens. If you have any family issues with health or with educational needs, it's second mortgages, it's home property. This, the transfers of all this wealth away from minority communities and into wealthy white communities has been tremendously significant intergenerational. It's not just a one-time transfer. It, it's, the, it's the money that keeps giving. 
we talked a bit about education, but then I want to talk here a little bit about what's happened in the same last 40 years, which is the kind of fixation and culturalization of black ghetto life. The idea that the ghetto is a black cultural space and that it's not a structural formation and that it's not the product, that street culture and gangs and drugs and guns and sex trade and fill in the blank, whatever the alternative economies you know, largely in very fragile and disrupted communities get understood as a black thing, right? A cultural thing. And if you really pay attention to what happens in this same 40 year period, the, and it's an ever narrowing description of black life so that it's only really black when it functions as a mirror of the stereotype of the ghetto. So the ghetto becomes not a form of structural racism, not a form of deprivation of circumstances and oppression, but a kind of cultural choice. You know, like, I, I chose the ghetto. I open up the paper. I want to live somewhere. They say a ghetto apartment. I circle it. I go visit <laughs> because I'm interested. I think I can just do my thing in the ghetto. So there are many other examples we could talk about here. And there's a monumental set of, of, of forces that are happening. So of course this is daunting. But at the same time, there have been amazing points of entry. And part of the value of this structure, as opposed to others, at least as I see it now, is that it provides lots of points of entry that can be accumulative in value. The Ban the Box movement. I don't know how many of you know about the Ban the Box. A few hands. That's pretty good. That's great. Um, so the general principle at first was to outlaw the use of, of the requirement that, that anyone who was a felon or went to jail would have to check a box to say so, which is just adding stigma on top of stigma, like, you know, as if you, 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 it's a permanent life sentence. You're always on your way to jail, right? You can't just have done it. So if you have, if you check the box, you know, they found, of course, oh, lo and behold, you know, ex-cons didn't get hired. What a shock and what a surprise. And then be a black ex-con, oh, good, terrific. That's going to be really helpful. So they were trying to ban the box for jobs. But what the movement has moved to is ban the box for housing applications. Because if you find housing applications now, they say, you know, have you been a felon or been a prisoner? And now there's been a movement to even not allow people who live in public housing to have relatives who are returning from prison to live in public housing. So you have a sentence that is now, you know, destabilizing your whole family and community that you never end. So the Ban the Box has been a really terrific movement that has moved across. There have been tremendous fair lending organizations. Uh, there's been a county in um, Maryland, I guess it was Montgomery County, um, that a wealthy county that actually required developers to put affordable housing in their programs, otherwise they wouldn't approve the plans. And they've been successful for many, many years, although there's a lot of pressure to stop it, to create at least a multi-class, multi-race uh, county under a tremendous pressure. There's no way we're going to know all there is to know about structural racism, so of course we want to keep learning and keep growing. And so I'm hoping that we can use the visual and the emotional engagement to bring these ideas to the public. Thank you very much.